Let's do it live, fam. Welcome to Office Hours of Arbitrage Season 2, Episode 11. We've got one left. Uh, I've got Carlo with me this week. Carlo wrote a great article, a theme in these recent weeks of people writing excellent articles to help people start out. And I want to get to know them. I want to know what motivated them to do what they do and how they're doing in the tournament. So, Carlo, if you're ready, can I ask you some questions? Yeah, sure. Cool. Hey, well, let's start out with where do you live? Um, yeah, I'm from the Netherlands, born and raised. So, um... Okay, so you're in the Netherlands. What, what part? Um, I'm in the south. I'm on the university campus uh, in Eindhoven. Okay, no, very okay. nice. So are you a university student? Um, yeah, I'm studying data science. It's a okay. bachelor of studies. Uh, yeah. So that led me to my next question is what do you do for a living? So you study all the things. Um, yeah, and I'm working part-time uh, for an AI consultancy company, which is also on the university campus, uh, currently doing a computer vision uh, task for a robotics application. Very cool. That's what I'm working on a few days in the week. That's a, a very cool part-time gig while you're still studying. I yeah. I I'm a little jealous. Um, very nice. Uh, my colleague, uh, Ilya, is actually also on the call now. So. Oh, so you got to watch what you say. Well, I'll kick them out and then you can talk whatever you want to say. Oh. Um, how would your parents describe what you do besides being a student? Like, are they up to par on what you're working on? Yeah, I guess I would. I guess um, currently they're pretty knowledgeable because I've been talking about it for a few years now. But uh, I think they would explain it to someone else that I'm doing something with uh, big data or robotics, uh, I guess. So you look at all the data yeah, and all you put it in your computer machine and then you use your printer and you show people what's up. Yeah, we just uh, predict the magical number. And, uh, yeah, predict the magical number. Exactly. I wanted to make sure you got that because that's definitely very important context for the parents out there. Uh, Carlo, what do you do for fun in the Netherlands? You said it's really hot out there this time of year. Yeah, um, yeah currently I'm actually... Uh, Working a lot, but um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I play uh, drums. Okay. I used to play uh, professionally, actually, like uh, three years ago before I switched to artificial intelligence. And, I mean, that's uh, like not very congruent skill sets. No, it sounds uh, weird, but yeah, I was also always like comfortable with with numbers, but then I, yeah, went fully into music, and then I kind of came back to uh, technical things. So, uh, That's pretty cool. Yeah. So you I play the with... drums. You're the best neighbor ever. Like I would yeah. love to live right next to you or underneath you. Not. Yeah, I can play drums here, but my parents oh, good, good. in the area, so I practice uh, there. So besides yeah. playing drums, what else do you do? Um, yeah, I like doing uh, data science competitions on uh, Kaggle. Oh, here we go. Another workaholic. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did a couple of natural language processing competitions and computer vision. You're in great company with all these workaholics in here. Just saying. Yeah, I guess I'm a workaholic. <laughs> I also am a workaholic. So I know for sure what that feels like. Hey, uh, Carl, let me ask you a question. When did, when did you start participating in the Numerai tournament? Um, yeah, I checked it was um, October last year, but then I only um, uh, participated in one round and then left it for like three months because I was mostly doing uh, Kaggle competitions. But then, Oops. yeah, at one point I said, okay, now I'm going to work out a serious model and uh, yeah, see how it goes. So I think I've been running a model for around a little more than half a year now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Bet you wish you stuck around since October though. Uh, yeah, I wish I started earlier, actually. Yeah. So, how, how did you find out about the Numerai tournament? Um, yeah, I think it was through some YouTube channel or through Kaggles, just some data science platform where I heard about uh, Numerai. But it was not very clear back then how to get started or how to acquire uh, Numerai. So you found out about Numerai through your data science channels. Yeah. But what do you wish you had known when you started out? Yeah, I wish I knew more about um, validation, I guess. Especially okay. 
cross validation because yeah it takes some time to evaluate now how good is your model actually and at the beginning i i had quite high experiment scores but then the performance wasn't that high so uh, i figured out that i had to use more metrics and uh, sometimes just let it run for a month before judging uh, how good it is right yeah let it run let it ride out and stick around for sure because um, yeah. those big gaps, they kind of have, well, they're gaps and it's very difficult to infer anything from your model, even if you kept it all the same because you have that missing data point. Um, Carlo, a lot of people think the tournament is challenging to the point it becomes overwhelming and too much to handle. Even you did that, sir. You bailed on it for a little while. Uh, wh why did you do that? And what can we tell people so that they don't also fall into that trap? Yeah, I think at the beginning it seemed mostly like a competition, like get a high place on the leaderboard and only then you can do it properly. But I needed to figure out that you can, yeah, you can use uh, stake on Numerai profitably without being in the in the top uh, models. And that uh, the community is actually really uh, kind and open. I already figured that, but also figured that out quite late. So uh, that's nice. Yeah, and to start staking was uh, a little bit harder, I guess. Yeah. Like the exchanges are, um, it can be trusted and stuff like that. I think you brought up something that maybe I haven't considered in some time. And that is you can have a profitable model without being on the top of the leaderboard. And you're 100% right. The rank doesn't really matter week to week in the early stages. What matters is that you have a positive correlation score. Yeah, exactly. And, and I don't think it says that anywhere in the documentation. And if you are a, like a Kaggle type person and you're used to just raw rank being performance, that, that makes sense why you might consider that to be a dangerous thing. That's a good point. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that in my mental bank of things to think about because I think that's important. Um, Carlo, what programming language do you use and why? Um, yeah, I do everything in Python because yeah, currently all the time Python and the Numa API is in Python. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I use a little bit of R in my studies, in data science language, but I don't really like it. So, uh, <laughs> why don't you like R? I want to know. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think it's flexible enough, or I can. Yeah, I'm quite used to uh, to Python now, and. I guess I'm also missing the, the standard libraries and the, the easy APIs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I also use R, but more for time series stuff for my research. But if I can do it in Python, I do. But, you know, if you use something so often, it just becomes second nature. Um, yeah, I, I agree, NJ. I think we need Omni Analytics to, to join once, like ever. What, what is this, the 25th? total episode and dude hasn't even shown up once i'm calling him out you know what this is an official call out to on the analytics he's got to join I help win. me pressure him peer pressure <laughs> for the win are there people who are solely using r for uh, numerai there's plenty of people using it um just don't really encounter them wiggle muses down they're going pick me pick me <laughs> and yeah so there's plenty of people doing it uh I tried it once or twice. It just didn't really fit my workflow. Um, Michael Oliver says I use RPy2 to avoid R, and if I want to, and if I want to use a package. So yeah, you can. I mean, you can pass Python code through all the way to an R kernel and and then spit back a data frame. So yeah, and then R users can use a notebook and run Python code the same way. They kind of work back and forth. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. So that was a that was a cool segue. I didn't mean to get too far away from your interview questions, but Carlo, can you tell us your top three tips for the tournament, sir? Um, yeah, so I think we already discussed one, like uh, set up a good validation scheme, use uh, plenty of different metrics, and uh, take your time to uh, evaluate your models. Before that was mistake. way too fast, my man. Let's just... <laughs> Let's unpack that a little bit further. So cross-validation strategies, why do you think that's important? Yeah, because if you can internally validate your model, then you're a lot further than... Um... Specifically, how do you do that? If you're willing to share, like maybe in generalities. 
Yeah, at the moment I'm stumbling a lot because I used to use the standard validation uh, data from Numerai, but now I'm also incorporating that data into my training. So uh, I see uh, Michael Oliver shared this article um, about times error-wise time series, mm -hmm. and I'm really excited about that. So uh, I would like to uh, try that out. Yeah, try like all the things, right? So maybe don't just have one end all be all cross validation strategy. Maybe try different ones for different models. I mean, we, we get 10 slots. So there's 10 opportunities to try something new. But yeah. for sure, you said your number one tip was to be careful with your cross validation. I completely agree. So yeah, I think time series based uh, split makes the most sense. What was your second tip? Yeah, use plenty of different uncorrelated models in your own models. And with, uh, with Kaggle competition, there is often like 70% gradient boosting machines and 30% uh, neural networks. And I think that is also sensible to use with Numerai, but it seems that neural networks are a bit more, more useful for uh, Numerai models, but I haven't tested that hypothesis uh, yet. Well, I encourage you to try it out. I know there's plenty of people using neural nets, far more people using tree-based models, and then even more people using linear models, and then even more people are using ensembles. So there's room for everybody. Um, I'm just trying to catch up on chat real quick. Uh, Sweaty Bear says, it's fine for this since you aren't really putting stuff into production. And sure, there's compute, but and then dot, dot, dot. Yeah, Sweaty Bear, I agree. Uh, I assume we're still talking about R in chat, but like eyeballs, folks. Focus, focus, conversation. Keep the flow, keep the flow. All right. So I digress. There was a third tip that we just breezed right over. I wanted to. Yeah, the third, Suraj already uh, talked about it last week, but uh, yeah, the community is actually really kind and sharing a lot. So uh, thank you, sir. Yep. Yes, indeed. Definitely check in with the community, visit Rocket Chat, read the office hours with arbitrage summaries. It's a lot of golden nuggets in there. And I think. A little birdie told me that these are going to be uploaded to YouTube soonish. Is that right, NJ? Do I have that right? Uh, no, I do. I do still intend to do that. I've just been a little preoccupied. Little busy, fam. Little busy. Big news week. Just saying. Um, yeah. So cool. Just you know, just want to circle back and check, make sure I wasn't propagating fake news. So yeah, we'll look forward to that soon. Uh, hopefully things calm down a little bit for NJ and the team. Um, yeah, so check with the community, ask questions. I think people are very willing to help if you show a willingness to read and do your homework first. Yes, and a lot like of- Oliver is laughing. Yes, yes. Please do a little bit of homework first before you come in and ask us to write your whole model for you. Thanks. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Carlo, that, that makes perfect sense. Those are great tips, thank you. Um, here's a fun one. You can say whatever you want. It's just gonna go on YouTube, so whatever. Uh, if you could have a billboard with anything on it, what would it say and why does it say that? Or show or, I mean, it's your billboard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, yeah, this is one phrase from um, Steve Jobs from a Stanford speech. I don't know if you, uh, if you saw that one, 2005, I guess. Like, well, um, what is it? Um, you can connect the dots moving forward, you can only connect them moving backwards. So you have to trust moving forward that somehow things will work out and somehow the dots will get connected. Nice. I think that's a powerful um, statement. I like it. It's a view on just, just going and uh, don't worry too much. That's great. Hey, I have another controversial question. Who's your favorite team member? Yeah, I think that's pretty clear. That's uh, NJ. Oh, that's a commanding lead. It's over. That's and besides, really she's cool. being interviewed next week. NJ wins this season. Game over. Congratulations, NJ. You are the favorite team member for season two. Yes, well-deserved. Well-deserved. Hey, I have a question for you because you have epic hair, kind of like kind of like I'm getting epic hair, and Michael Oliver's got some pretty cool hair, and Jason and the team's got some pretty cool hair. So, like, uh, any tips on styling this stuff? Like, what do I do with this big rat's nest in the back of my head? I don't know what to do with this thing. Just let it go? Just let it grow, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm going to tell my girlfriend that. You're my hero. It'll Thank you. Work out fine. 
Uh, Carlo, if you could go back in time and talk to your 18 year old self, what would you say to yourself? I mean, I know that was probably like yesterday, but. <laughs> no, I'm a little older than that. I tease, I tease my friend. Um, yeah, don't worry too much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, be open to, uh, to other cool stuff. Like you may think you want to become a, a professional drummer right now, but something else may be in store for you. Yeah, don't, don't bang the drums for a living. Study math a little harder. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like my, my, little, my little neighbors are always like, hey, man, cool sneakers. And I was like, you can have as many sneakers as you want. Just study math. Work hard. I'm trying to motivate them to, you know, do the thing. So that's cool, man. Um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to become a data scientist? Yeah, there's so much information um, out there, so it's it's very easy to get uh, get started. It's also very easy to get lost. Yeah, but uh, yeah, as a general tip, I would um, go over um, yeah value consistency the most. So just study every day, or even if it is only 15 minutes, but you will learn a lot more than if you yeah once a week uh, take the whole day uh, to study. And, uh, yeah, do you so like my... those hundred days to code things? Uh, yeah, I did uh, something hundred days of ML code a few uh, okay. years. Ago. Uh, to your point, like just keep doing it. Like don't quit. Do hundred days straight. I just I like that concept. I I don't know if that works for everybody, but you're right. If you take a whole week between your coding sessions, you're going to forget everything. It's it's not enough. I encountered that with my students when I was teaching Python to them because so we met weekly, and I said, look, if you wait two or three days after the lecture to sit down and try this stuff again, you're going to forget everything we talked about tonight. So go home, try a little bit, wake up the next day, try a little bit, and then see if it sticks. Said, but if you wait until six days from now to sit down and try to do your assignment, you're going to get lost. And everybody who contacted me the night before the assignment was due was having a hard time. So yeah, stay on it, be consistent. I totally agree. Learn new things. Uh, do you think that uh, domain knowledge is necessary for data science. And what I mean by domain knowledge is like, I studied finance. So, you know, doing uh, computer imaging is probably going to be really hard for me. Is it necessary to have domain knowledge? Um, yeah, I can't really tell about uh, finance. I don't know. Uh... But you could probably do it. Well, you are because you're doing numeri. And so that's what I mean. Like, you don't necessarily have to study computer science in order to do data science, right? You just have to be willing to try new things. True? Yeah, and there are a lot of tangible properties. If you can solve one problem with uh, gradient boosting machines, you can probably solve another problem. And That's with right. neural networks even more, you can just switch to uh, text and computer vision and you can transfer a lot of your knowledge to those new problems. Yeah, because I think there's this myth out there that if you studied, I mean, I couldn't even come up with an example really, but it, it, you have to be this super genius in computer science in order to do data science. Therefore, I'm not even going to try. And it's simply yeah. not true. I think that's an important message to get out there. You know, give it a go. Try, try to learn a new thing. Um, we're all having to work from home. We're not getting to do the things that we like to do. Why not learn a new skill? Why not let it be coding? Yeah. yeah, and I also think uh, data science competitions, are, uh, at least I learned the most from, uh, from doing competitions and just diving into uh, new problems and trying to do quick prototyping and uh, learning from uh, someone else's insights. And just try how far can you get. No, it makes sense. So you're studying data science now, but if you could study anything else, concurrently and it didn't affect your current path, what would you study? Concurrency? Yeah, so like you study this, in other words, you're doing your data science thing, you're fine, right? We're not, I'm not asking you to like consider changing anything, but if you could add more courses or a whole new field of study and it didn't impact what you're currently doing, what would you study? Yeah, I actually think I would study um, some more finance 
and I'm actually diving into that uh, some more next year with uh, option uh, theory and stuff like that. So, uh, Have but, fun, my friend. That is a rabbit hole that is deep, 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 deep. Spent my entire life studying finance from fifth grade. United States, I guess that's like what, like year five is what they call it in Europe, I think. And I never let go. I've just always been fascinated by business. And I'll never learn everything. Someday, maybe if I'm lucky, I'll be Dr. Taylor, finance professor, and I still won't know everything. I'll still want to know more. So be careful. That's a deep, deep, deep rabbit hole. Okay. Carlo, I thank you for joining me today. I hope you'll stick around because we actually have some questions in Slido for you. Yeah, sure. I'll stay. I also have a question of my own. I'm curious what you think of it. Yeah, so hang out. Um, Michael Oliver, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you kind of made shockwaves through the rocket chat with your forum post. Can you give us like a quick summary of it? Um, it was, I, th I thought something fairly simple. I mean, it's just a way to uh, use groups, which can be, which can be arrows uh, with the time series cross-validation code. So basically I just modified the sklearn time series code um, to take the groups argument and use it correctly. Well, the kid noises are welcome, don't worry. It's fine. Right. There we go, everybody has to wait. There we go. Hi. <laughs> um, one second. Hey, you're all good, man. You're all good. Let's see. Okay. That one. Yeah, you got to restart the video. Very yeah. important. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, I, <laughs> I, I like I like time series cross validation for because you're only always predicting on the future, and so you can't ever really cheat. I mean, we try to make that not much of an issue, but there's always future potentially future information that could enable you to cheat on the past. Um, I have a very specific question about that. Sure. If we're neutral to the time component, then why the hell does it matter? Um, so I would say neutralization is always linear and the world is nonlinear. And uh, so I would answer it like that. So specifically what I mean is if we're worried about future peaking in the, in the sense of a time series, right? Sure. And I just it's, it's a linear I, trend and it's always going up. Yeah, I would agree with you. Sure. But I, it's I, neutral. That's all taken out. So I think uh, is it possible no, that, that your 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 well, methodology is just kind of a different way of grouping stuff, not necessarily that it's time series. Aware? Um it's no well so, uh again, I think my uh linear and nonlinear thing applies. Um and I would also say because like the relationship between the variables can change over time and yes. Um, and if their function, if, uh, so potentially if you're using a relationship from the future to predict the past, uh, that can be cheating in some way, because maybe that relationship only sort of appeared at some point in the future. Good uh, point. That was the missing link that I didn't consider. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, okay. so I, I'll I like buy in now. I was, I was a little skeptical. I just wanted to have a conversation and see if you could sure. bust my priors and you did. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, 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 so that's why I like it. I've found using that way to choose hyperparameters seems to work pretty well in practice. Um, so I just thought it, as a tool for people to use, uh, it would be, it would be good just to have out there as a, and, and I, to, as I mentioned, I use basically that and, um, just some basic, uh, feature selection things on three of my best models. And so I, I, I decided not to give the exact parameters I found because, there's, I, I gave you everything you need to find them yourselves and hopefully you'll find right. different and better ones. Um, and so, yeah, that's, and so yeah, I, yeah, people, we, were, we mentioned we were planning to open source some models. So this was the first step. Towards no, that. and thank you. I, I was very glad to see it. And I'm also glad that you didn't just give out the whole model because I don't think that has any value because then people just plug and play. Yeah, um, exactly. I think for those that come here to learn, that's the kind of stuff that they need to be given so that they can take a framework and then build it themselves. So yeah, that's, I think that's, that's perfect. And I, I wouldn't ask you to do any more on it than what you've already done. Um, but if people like break it, I'm sure you're willing to help fix it, right? Sure, yeah. If, yeah. Uh, if people find it uh, something that doesn't work or whatnot or uh, edge cases. Um, yeah, so there's, uh, I, I made it 
So uh, there's a couple other tricks you can do with it, like in jobs parameter for the cross file thing. If you have a bunch of cores, uh, for instance, X, X, uh, so like XG boost. Geez, dad, uh, get that thing running. What the heck? <laughs> uh, so like XG boost tends to peak in its performance around like eight core, eight threads. Um, so throwing more threads, XG boost often doesn't help. So, but if you have more cores than that, you can do like uh, eight, throw eight threads at XG boost and then run in three jobs for the cross file thing simultaneously. So you'll be uh, running 24 things simultaneously. Um, that's a nice way to optimize a little bit more depending on your machine. Um, and so there, and so there is a strange thing I did where I reversed the order in which you fit the things. So you fit the largest ones first uh, and then do the smaller ones. And the reason I did that is so that if you had like three groups out of five, it would do the larger ones first. And so things would, you get more things finishing at the same time. Um, and uh, rather than like finishing the, all the short ones first and then being stuck with one long one um, at the end. So uh, yeah, so I, I, this is something I've used uh, and tried to optimize. So I hope people find it useful. No, thank you. That's great, fantastic. Um, and I appreciate you let me put you on the spot there. So it's Slido time. And I actually pinned the question. Carlo asked it. Thank you for asking this question, Carlo. Uh, it's got four thumbs up. When Sorios. When Sorios. I agree. Uh, I really would like Sorios to join. But I don't know. I don't know. Siraj has a question. And Carlo, this one's for you. Carlo, great writing. Would you please like to share some insights about how you choose and decide between abstraction and elaboration while writing? Now, that's a very interesting question. We don't really talk about writing in the office hours, but why not? You know what? It's office hours. You ask whatever you want. Yeah, I think a pitfall of mine is that I want to include like all kinds of uh, small details. But yeah, I was writing a getting started uh, post, so not everyone, it would not be sensible to put everything in there. So what I do is just write everything down and then truncate it from there. And with weights and biases, uh, everyone has an, uh, an editor who also reads through it and, uh, and adjusts some things. So um, yeah, I just guess the advice is just write everything down and then remove things from there. At least that works for me. Um, and also, Siraj, I would also add to pay attention to who your audience is. If you're writing something new, like Carlo just said, you know, it's probably too much to go into too big a detail. Keep it simple if you're doing a beginner's article. However, if you're writing for an audience like JRB or Michael Oliver, you know, you, you might as well run it through peer review. Okay. Put it on archive, get comments run it through the peer review process again on the second edition, get it published, and then tell it to Michael Oliver and JRB. Only then. Otherwise, it's not gonna be sufficient. JSR has a question. What if the team use all previous submissions and their metrics to somehow model the relationship between submission stats and live performance and suggest improvements? So I think what, you're asking for is for the team to look at what we've been doing over time and then kind of look at how our model did and say, hey, why don't you try this thing? I think that's what, what's going on. Michael Oliver, why can't you do that? It's possible, but we're not definitely not going to give you metrics from the back test. Um, yeah. We're, we don't want to leak any information from the, the test data. Uh, but we were, but yeah, Mike, uh, there should uh, be new metrics from the validation data uh, coming soon. So this is potentially soon. a good reason to not, not, tr uh, it's getting pretty close. I, um, uh, but yeah, obviously they will only be valid if you are not training on your validation. Um, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> uh, but it's potentially a good reason to not train on validation. Um, I don't, yeah. I, I think I don't think that you really need to train on validation. Um, I agree, and uh, and I think it might be better to just leave the other ones out as as 
either hypervalidation search, like t uh, ways to test different parameters or techniques. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. So the what if question is answered by no, because you'll then just overfit and introduce bias. Yeah. And two, they're coming out with stuff soon to help you a little more. So stay tuned because that's coming soon. Uh, a month? I think, I think sooner. Maybe. I, I think definitely within a month. Okay. Well, we'll see. I won't hold you to it because yeah, it's, it's uh, past two weeks but, have been kind of nuts. Yeah. I, uh, but yeah, I think it's getting pretty close. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks. Which is the metric or combination of several should we optimize for? Basically, what should I optimize for a single metric or a basket of metrics or, or what have you? It seemed like I saw a discussion in Rocket Chat about that. And basically, we all have a, a different thing we're optimizing for nowadays, especially with the reputation bonus falling off. And I would say that there is no one metric to rule them all. And you should consider several. But if in your 10 model set, you want to try different things, then you may have different optimization strategies across your different set of models. I have some that I'm optimizing for numeri sharp. I have some that I optimize for correlation. And yeah, it, it, everybody's going to have a different answer. Um, maybe somebody only looks at their maximum drawdown. That one I would be in favor of because if you can minimize your drawdown and just let your model run wild on the positive eras, you're going to have a very good model. I'm not speaking to MMC because I, I can't possibly predict what good MMC looks like because it's dependent on what everybody else does. But you can't, I would say, don't just chase high average correlation. I think that's risky. That said, some of the people at the top of the leaderboard are doing just that. Don't know how that's going to work out long term. Um, Tom, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. Oh. And there was this one version of sharp ratio where we um, subtract uh, some kind of constant from the mean and then um, multiply by the square root of 12 or something like. Um, to annualize it. Mm -hmm, because the validation eras are months. So that square root of 12 puts it into an annualized basis. And that constant term, as Richard told us, was basically the trading costs. And so in, in finance, you, you know, oh, great, you have 1.03 alpha. Or will actually be 0.03 alpha. But if, if that doesn't overwhelm the trading costs and you really aren't making any money, that model is maybe good but only in an environment where there's no transaction costs, no borrowing fees, and, and no other expenses to consider. And, and that just doesn't fit reality. And so that's why you subtract out the trading costs. It gives you a better idea of how you're actually doing. So that's no. the numeri sharp. But, and then it has to be adjusted further if you evaluate it on the live eras because those are weeks, even though they take a month to resolve, they're stacked. I actually have an open question with a colleague on how to adjust for that, given it's still a monthly sequence, but it's a weekly concurrent bet. I don't know. I don't have the answer to that right now. I'm still kind of letting the numbers crunch in my head, thinking about it. You know, that's, that's one of those ones that's a little odd because I haven't seen that in finance before where you have like a one portfolio, but it's really four, but it's really one. I'm just, I'm lost on it. It's complicated. Um, so yeah, the numeri sharp is what I said, and that's in, I think it's in the forum. If I know I put code up for it. It's in the metrics. Kino, you wanted to say something or ask? Yeah, just like uh, briefly that uh, I target um, on, on my three of these models, I target uh, variance over correlation and now variance over correlation plus MMC over the last 20 rounds. How's it, how are they doing? Um, like for, like, the, like I, the three are like 4%. So 0 0.004 correlation and, uh, and variance is like, I mean, I mean, they have like very low variance, like 0, 0.00 something. And, uh, and that's good. But, but, but again, you, you know, that's the thing is like, we don't really know how steady the payouts are going to be in the long run. So right now they're about to change and they're about to change something that like, I, I feel or I sense 
that it's just like very short term. So it's like four weeks. They don't care how you do like over like 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 a longer period. So, but then again, it's no guarantee. So if you follow like a short term strategy right now, then like two months down the road, when they change it again, you have screwed yourself basically. So, On the assumption that they change it in two months. But well, that's pretty that stable is, now for a long every, time. Every six months. So like around every six months, there's changes. So I I I don't I don't sense that they have figure it out altogether what is best for them. In so, fairness, they have changed it about every six months. Yeah, so um, uh, so yeah, so basically that's it. It's like if you, we don't know, if we have uncertainty over like the long run, then my, uh, my best metric is like, just like something that is stable and gives you like, sort of like, it's not the highest correlation, but it's high. You know? and, mm -hmm. and I have like other models that like are like more experimental, but the stake weighted thing that is happening right now, so for instance, like Michael's uh, like models, uh, MDO, it's uh, number three on the leaderboard, but like if you see it's, uh, it's average, like, you know, uh, correlation over the last 20 rounds is not that high. So, uh, so, so again, it, it's, it depends. So we don't really know what to optimize for. Yeah, I, I would say my, my number one feature request until today, I guess until today has been to allow us to adjust our stakes more quickly with a better interface, et cetera, et cetera. It's like not happening, so I'm kind of giving up. My next request would be, don't change the payouts in any way for as long as possible. So now that would change the game, right? Because now I'm optimizing for that stability, and then I want to maximize my return over whatever time frame I choose. Next question in Slido. Grand Pump Railroad. I love these names. It's, it's epic. I don't know how you come up with this stuff. It's good. Can the team elaborate on how predictions are combined? Have you gone from simple averaging to stacking or some sort of IPW? I don't know what IPW stands for, so I'm going to have to ask somebody to help me out. Michael Oliver, I hope you were uh, listening to that one. Uh, I, I was listening. Yes. Uh, got him this time. Uh, I don't know how much I can say, but it's, yeah, we're, we're not doing anything particularly complicated. Okay. I mean, previously it was a stake weighted. It's still stake weighted. Okay, good enough for me. Uh, and I would imagine that Richard's post on the, on the topic, I think it was in a Medium article, probably is still very informative on the topic. Yeah. And Anonymous is asking, how can I start staking any video tutorial? So that's the coming soon answer that I can give you. Um, I'm definitely in the process of working on that. I'm just trying to get some better production value out of what's going on. And we're close. We're really close to getting started on that. I imagine that I'm going to do it similar to how I taught in my class. My audience for who I teach would be beginners. Oh, we have a dog. We've got to say hi to the dog. Hi, Wiggle Muse's dog. It's a cutie. Um, so I will probably start out with the very, very, very basics and then layer in content as we go and put it in smaller segments. And then eventually I'll get to the full analysis and tips notebook and go from top to bottom. I think that video will be about an hour long, <laughs> but so there will be some videos that are long, some that are short, some that'll be one off, maybe uh, requested stuff that we can go over and we'll take it from there. Uh, as for how can you start staking specifically without a video tutorial, check out Rocket Checks. I think that came up just today, today being August 20th, time being 4.48 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Just to give you a little sync if you're listening now in this Zoom. Uh, so you can go in Rocket Chat and check it out. We'll call it a week. Next week, we have NJ, the boss. And other than that, hey, everybody have a great week. And I'll see you in Rocket Chat. Bye. Bye.